and on again. Um, Carolines in particular, uh, different um, variety of hassle. This is recording. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, mostly they ignore those, the other birds, I and mean, that's what it seems to be. And occasionally the birds hassling lose out. Um, so we'll see what, see what we can find. There we go. So we're learning all sorts of things. Hang on, it's on. Why is it not working, Jeff? I'll turn it off and on again. Hang on. Oh, there we go. So we look a bit, a little, little of the history of the nests, why we're doing the research, and a little of what we've found. We have about ten and a half thousand hours of um, video clips to look at, all of which takes a huge amount of time to go through, but just a few um, findings so far. Down on the river, this way, is their favourite daytime roost and has been for a long time. Um, if you're an eagle, this is a good spot to sit. Parramatta River, dense mangroves behind, good view up and down the river. Here's an eagle, here's an eagle, and this is the nests in 2004 that failed. Um, the birds died, and I'll tell you a little more later. This is, in fact, what started it all going. Behind us in the Nature Reserve woodlands is a nest, um, a new nest at the moment, but it's a nest that's been there for at least 20 years or so, not this nest, but nearby. Been a massive nest and used by a succession of eagles. So from way back in 1990 odd, we've, we've seen birds there, we've known they've been in the woodland, going in and doing other surveys. They've been seen around. We've found dead birds, but no breeding for a long time. 2003. Lo and behold, suddenly there was a young bird in the nest, which was brilliant. And in 2004, as I said, the um, female died on the nest just as they were about to hatch. We found the male bird washed up, had um, toxicology tests done on them, necropsy, high levels of contaminants, particularly dioxin, but not um, sufficient to have killed them. So we really don't know. But it was recommended that we keep looking and study, looking at and studying the eagles, which is why we've kept going. A couple of years, no breeding. 2008, which is when we started looking really closely, um, this bird fledged, got into trouble, um, was rescued and unfortunately died in care. Next year, laid two eggs. We um, didn't even know there were two chicks for a while. And there was one weeny little one we saw which was either killed or died. But that eaglet fledged. Um, 2010, two, which was absolutely brilliant. And they left the nest, fledged. 11, the nest fell down. Then they built a new one very quickly, fortunately quite close by. Um, two, two chicks hatched and that was the chick that I mentioned earlier that we're not quite sure why it died. We suspect something to do with the pigeon it was fed with the um, um, scatterbird which is amino pyridine um, used to control pigeons. We don't know. I couldn't find the body but that's what we suspect um, affected it. But one bird fledged and flew. If you know the area that was over in the Waterbird Refuge in Bicentennial Park. Of course, once they go to this stage, we don't know what happens to them. But they've fledged and off they've gone. This year, or last year I should say, another new nest, most inconsiderate when it comes to placing our cameras. Um, the two, two birds um, fledged and I'll come to a little more of their history as we go along. Success. So I think five years of one or two um, young ones being... Um, Raised to fledging, I think, is a success story compared with all of the bad horror stories in the past. So what we're looking at is the breeding relationships of the, the eagles here as a result of the recommendations that we keep looking at them. Um, and we've had the wonderful opportunity of putting up the CCTV cameras, eagle cam, and we can either watch them all time during daylight hours or the other year even at night and we hope we can get um, a nighttime camera up again this year. So what's on the menu? I'm looking particularly at what we've found out they've been eating. We can study them directly at the nest from the cameras. 
Um, people watch along the bay. We've got photographers. We've got people observing. We can see what they're catching along the river and in the bay. And we collect some prey remains. It's not nearly as easy as some of the other studies have seemed to have been. We find very little under the nests because it's actually... Um, there's a time of the breeding that we don't go near them at all, so we don't disturb them. But it's also hard to find anything because the nest's up really high and on the ground there's um, dense bush and grasses and you just can't find the bloody stuff. But there's a whole lot of little collections of bags up there with nasty little remains that we've picked up, which kids love looking at and which we're developing um, education programs around. So, the sort of things we see from the camera, we can get brilliant pictures like this. Sometimes um, identifying what the food is is a little difficult. And we've also taken pictures from the ground with a zoom, um, zoom lens from a couple of our brilliant photographers from our little hide that we had. We don't go in from when um, they begin or before they begin laying till the chicks are four or five year, weeks old. We don't go anywhere in the nest at all, nor does any other staff. Only in an, uh, a complete emergency. We get incidental observations along the river. I must confess that was a bit of a setup, that picture. But we do some, have some other brilliant pictures of um, the eagles catching fish. Down on the river, we can observe what they've, they're eating in the bay. Um, we pick up some prey remains. That's some of the bits I've picked up. It's interesting I've found less this year. I think just because the nest's in a, um, a spot where it's harder to find um, what they drop on the ground. It's great when you have kids, little Italian kids who go fishing, they pick that as a leather jacket straight off. What is it? Okay, that was really hard to identify. I kept finding these teeth. It's a fish. Um, I eventually went into a fish shop. I was trying to take pictures, but I was so embarrassed that poking my camera in fish's mouths. I bought a few fish and cooked him up and picked it all off and that's actually brim teeth. So whenever I find little um, teeth like that, you know they're brim. We find bits like this occasionally, which is flying fox. And we have found very, very few pellets. And the only pellets I have found have only got feathers in them. Um, a lot of the fish or the prey remains probably fall in the river and I just don't think they produce many. So we know they specialise in catching fish and silver gulls, so that's our birds. We've never seen them taking um, prey from other birds. There's no whistling kites here or very rare. Osprey recently, very rare here. Um, they possibly take things from cormorants, starters, never seen it. And they probably scavenge. A low tide, be all sorts of stuff along the river. Um, now, this is just an idea, give you an, um, an idea in November, from hatch to the end of November, going through millions of little clips, and it's only an idea, but it just gives you an idea from the uh, female and the male. So they're both bringing in a lot of food. So this is what I've seen at the nest. Mainly fish, both of them. Um, this is um, bugger to find no prey, um, just can't identify it. Um, lots of carcass that's probably bird, hard to tell. And quite a lot of gulls. I suspect that when I look closer at some of the other results, there'll be a lot more gulls identified because there's lots of feathers in the forest. That's something we do find. So that's not complete. And we don't know who caught it. Who brings it in? Not sure. So looking at some of the things that they've caught, a lot of fish. We can tell a lot of these from, from the camera or what we've seen them bringing in. Flounder was interesting. Um, they catch a lot of eels. They particularly catch eels in the constructed wetlands here. Um, because it's green and gold bell frog habitat, the ponds are drained regularly, so the water drops, the eels are very um, um, evident and the eagles go and pick them off, which is great. That's controlling for mosquito fish, which predate on the um, bell frog tadpoles. But they also catch um, eels down in the river. 
some of the bits and pieces. Um, this, I believe, is whiting with little teeth. Um, leather jacket and then just other, other fish bones and so on. So we can look closely at this and try and identify some more. Just a few pictures from the cameras. Often when the male brings in fish, the head's gone. They just bring it in like this. So this little fish, big fish, I think that's amazing to show the mum's claws compared with the teeny little um, eaglets. Quite small fish. Bigger fish, heads gone, all these ones. Um, sometimes the heads are on them and sometimes the male will bring it in and it's still alive. And how the chicks don't get flopped out of the nest beats me. Flops around. Down on the river, that's a pretty big one. Some of the uh, people in the audience, you might recognise some of your photos. Thank you very much. Um, and this is one of our young birds. It's actually holding a small fish. We don't know whether he actually caught it, but um, it's um, brilliant to see it for the first time this year. We've actually seen the young birds down on the river. Well done, Peter. <laughs> um, another small one there. Uh, now, well, this is going to work, Jeff. Here we go. This is the view we can get on the camera, which is just wonderful. So, so the female's sitting on the eggs, and this is a fish that's been brought in. No idea what that noise is. I've never heard it here before. It's some pump. That... Can someone read that date? I can't quite see. Oh, I, know, it's, that's, I remember it's about two days before they hatched last year. I'll just show you how it flies off with it. For some reason, he flew off with this one. <laughs> <laughs> we have many, many... Eel, you see the eel? And they bring massive big eels in sometimes that are still alive as well. So they catch them down on the river. Ah, the birds, so predominantly silver gull, but they've also brought in pigeons, which as I said is given problem. We've seen bring in miners, common miners, which may have been um, affected by scatterbird. I wouldn't have imagined that sea eagles would bother with common miners. Um, a dusky moorhen and a rainbow lorikeet. We've had some pictures of lorikeets coming and sitting on the nest, but they actually caught one this year, so serves them right. <laughs> um, they'll catch quite young gulls, so they don't just catch littlies, they also catch big ones. Occasionally they bring them in live, which is a little distressing um, for people watching. I imagine for the gull as well. <laughs> And then they, they'll pluck them. So there's lots of feathers around. But just note the condition of the nest there, because I'll come back to that. Um, interesting shot this. It's caught a gull. The magpie's going for it. And everybody else is escaping. So when you hear all the fuss on the waterbird refuge or one of the wetlands, all the birds carrying on, we always look up because it's probably the eagle. Gull didn't make it. Um, carrying off bits and pieces. So just give you an example of all the things that we see. Um, quite a young, uh, a big bird. There's a little chick in the background. Uh, that's not a very good picture, but that was a tiny little eagle. Uh, gull chick they brought in as well. Whereas the, our babies now are big. They'll often bring in a carcass of something, so you have to look closely at it. For example, yellow legs, you know, what is it? It's hard to um, pick sometimes. Um, not only do they bring in... Um, kids in particular are all fascinated with all these things that we find, like the little turtle shells, um, hares. I'm not sure that they catch the hares. There's foxes here. Um, also, we don't bait for any animals here. Um, any fox control is um, with traps and then they're shot. 
but the foxes do get hairs. We have a lot of hairs here, heritage hairs, from um, Depression days. The Navy and Brickworks people used to raise hairs for live coursing for greyhounds and also for food, and they've just naturalised here, so hence heritage hairs. They're tolerated to a certain extent. But this last season in particular, we saw the eagle feeding the young ones the rear end of a hare. So, and I found some what's definitely cat fur, so whether related or not, who knows. We've seen them carrying a blue tongue, and that's the hare bits and pieces that were found under the nest. Um, just... I'm still going through the data, but just to give you some ideas of some of the time budgets of what we looked at, this is when last year, S3 as we called it, first chick, this is its first day. Morning, night. Blue's the female. She made nine visits and she spent an average time of an hour, so she's basically on the nest most of the day. The male came in and out lots of times and they were it was brooded at night. So there's still an egg in the nest and she sat on the egg at night. The male brooded as well. He also fed them a bit, fed it a bit. He bought a brim, some other bird and a miner. And the, the, um, the young bird and the egg were only uncovered for a really short time. After a couple of days they've both hatched. The male's coming in and out a fair bit but the female's still there most of the time. Once again, morning, night. So she fed them lots, nine little short feeds because they're pretty small. Male did too. He's bringing in most of the food at this time and quite a lot of food. Now, this is just November, so they're... Um, 10 weeks old, the female, this is now 1st of November through to the end. And this is quite a short amount of time, okay? This is minutes. So the female's coming in nearly every day, but not for very long. Only once or twice a day, and there's some days when they're not getting anything to eat. So S4... Now, S4 is a younger bird, and it fledged at around 12 weeks. Um, that was, let's get the days, 82 days. And that was the older bird, because the S3 had, was rescued, had the fish hook incident, which I'll tell you. So S3 was a bit longer, 93 days. So the female came in short visits. This is over the whole month. The male not so often, but they're both coming in, but the male's only coming in really briefly. Some days nothing was brought to the nest. The female's bringing food now. The female's feeding them on the nest and both feeding themselves. But once S4 um, fledged, so that's the younger bird, it fledged and it went missing after about two days. Where was it? No idea. We just assumed it was gone, lost, dead. Because, hang on, when um, the, um, the other bird, the, first, the, the second bird um, fledged, it was hanging around the nest, they were bringing food in. But after about four weeks, it turned up again. So the parents must have been feeding them, feeding it elsewhere. No idea. Nobody saw it being fed until January, a couple of weeks after fledging. Um, talking about little eagles, there's lots of what they do, we simply don't see them. This is a big bird, there's a lot of people looking and they still keep a lot of their life secret, we simply don't know. But that must have been fed or it would have been dead. So they both turned up. So during those visits in November, just to show you what they've been eating, mostly fish at this stage it was, some birds, a rat, 15% don't know what it was. Okay. So we have so much information to go through, but just a few things we have found. Um, now, a little about the rescue, because when we rescued them, that was really, really interesting. 
So this is before they've fledged, before they've flown, but they're pretty big. Um, female, she's only coming in a couple of times during the day. There, yeah, two visits during the day, not staying for very long. So mainly they're on their own on the nest. The males brought a live whiting in, which the chicks had a good go at. But on that day, the male brought in a brim with a fishing line and a swivel on it. Um, it was people watching on Ustream that alerted us to this, and we were able to go back and look at the video and find out when that fish was brought in. So you can see the next morning, we could see the line. It's very hard to see, um, but looking at the camera, we could identify this. And during that day, we watched them, and the two chicks were actually tangled together. So working out what to do was difficult. But what was really interesting on that day, the female responded, I assume, to those distress calls. And she came in and brought, she came in nine times and she brought all that food, responding to those calls. She caught some of it because she was wet, but I'm not sure if the male gave some of it to her, but really interesting, completely different behaviour responding to those, I assume, those distress calls. <coughs> so on the day we had the big visit, uh, the big rescue, we had a cherry picker in there, if you're not aware, we were able to take a cherry picker in. Um, so she came in in the morning, um, just a brief time, five minutes. Um, the male came in a couple of times. They brought some food, but um, the poor bird with the hook was a bit unable to eat at this stage. It was taken down, the hook was too, too um, firmly in, taken off to the vet. It was a well-oiled rescue um, mission. The other bird was fed in the day. That's the hook that was down its throat. When it was brought back, um, the female had been in the nest in the morning. Um, it was brought back. Oh, we took the opportunity, by the way, of banding them. Uh, we grabbed the moment because we don't have ethics approval to handle the birds. But as we were handling them, we got um, rings from the, um, the zoo and we were able to band them, one on each leg, which was a really terrific opportunity. And we learnt that we can handle them relatively easily at this stage. Adults did nothing. We really didn't know what they were going to do. We were watching. The adults watched, but they didn't come anywhere near us. Whereas I know from previous years, before we put the cameras up, the adults would come and investigate or not really threaten us, but come pretty close if we were you know, too close to the nest. But at this stage and at this age, Jeff and I and others who go into the forest, we can really walk around underneath the adults and they really don't do anything. But the young birds were always more flighty. So we were very relieved when it, um, they brought food and the young ones... Um, took food. But what was really interesting was going up in the cherry picker um, and having you know, a level view with the nest. What I think is really interesting is there's no bits and bones and food left in the nest at all. Um, so we, even if we did have approval to go to the nest, there's nothing there. Um, they just carry it away. They take it away. Um, this is the bird that was rescued. It has a band on its right leg. Hang on, I've got that right? Yeah. This is the one that was rescued. It has operation. It was kept in overnight. It had a sleepover. It had antibiotics. It was stitched up. There was no point in keeping it any longer, so we brought it back and put it back on the nest. This is the first, the other bird. Now, it's been handled. But this submissive sort of, that's what I'm calling it, yeah, submissive posture, head down. But they were really relatively easy to handle and put back in the nest. So a wonderful success story. Now, we're watching um, the nest now. The two birds 
that were, one was missing, they've both come back, they've been seen flying around in the wetlands, and this is the first year we've actually seen the young in the area once they've fledged, so really interesting. Um, it's hard to spot their bands, but at least we can tell one's left leg, one's right leg. Um, so if anything happens to them, hopefully we'll find out, or at least we can watch them. I haven't seen them for weeks. The adults are going to the nest. They're fiddling around early in the morning, ringing in sticks. Our next job is to go in and get the cameras down again, um, bigger and better, hopefully night vision, better sound, um, and keep going. So thanks to all the wonderful people who've helped with them. Um, this project, it's ongoing, and that's what it's all about. Look at those crops. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we've got just a couple of minutes for questions, so maybe, Judy, you don't want to go anywhere. Jeffrey, maybe you want to come back up? There you are. That's interesting that currawong took the chicks. Yeah. Um, the currawongs of all the birds that chase ours are the only ones that go to the nest. Yeah. So perch, swoop, perch, yeah. swoop. And I can hear them calling over there today and I imagine they're near the adults. But when the chicks are small enough that the eagles would take them, the eels, eagles are there most of the time or nearby. So we don't know that. There's ravens go to the nest uh, sometimes but not when the eagles are there. Well, why don't we get the trends? Whereas I think there's... Sorry, wait for a sec. I think there's less currawongs here than there... That's just my impression than there would have been 10 years ago, but there's far, far too many ravens. Sorry? No. I suspect they eat calf here when the ponds are drained too. I just haven't particularly identified them yet, but I'm, I think some of the big scales might be carp scales. Any other questions? Any other questions? Well, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank all our speakers today. Um, I think we had a fantastic few sessions. So thank you very much, everybody. AGM.